on April 13th, 2006, I was there. Things were getting serious for my girlfriend and me. Nearly a week before this game, I decided that she would be the one I liked by my side for the long run. The day before I went to see the Giants and the Braves, I would ask her to marry me. I think I told that story already. So the last time the two of us went to a Sharks game in the 2005-06 season that I made a video on, it was a wild Saturday afternoon game. A couple of fights broke out. Scott Parker was literally climbing up the walls. Paul Correa resumed being a thorn in the Sharks' side in a Predators uniform, and the Sharks won an OT. They were still in danger of missing the playoffs. Before this game, we went to a game on April 1st. I would see the Phoenix Coyotes for the second time that season and would once again be in the same building as the Great One. The Sharks staged a huge comeback, scoring three goals in the third period to tie the game, then lost in overtime. While it earned them a point in the standings, it was the third straight loss at the worst possible time. After this game, they were still on the outside looking in, still sitting in 10th place in the conference. Then the Sharks kicked it into high gear, going on a six-game winning streak. After beating the Vancouver Canucks in overtime, the entire playoff picture changed dramatically. The streak shot the Sharks up from 10th to 6th in the conference. Meanwhile, the Canucks were hanging on to a playoff spot after April 1st. Then they lost four of the next five games and slipped to 9th place. So what does the story of the Canucks have to do with this episode? The two teams would play the back end of a home and home at the Shark Tank after meeting in Vancouver the night before. While the Sharks clinched a playoff spot because of the hot streak they were going through, the Canucks needed points to stay alive in the playoff hunt, or else. The competitive dynamic had changed after the lockout. It was going to be hard to make the playoffs with 90 points or fewer in the standings. As the years went by since 2006, sometimes having 95 points wouldn't cut it. The Canucks had many of the players remaining from the Marc Messier era after the six-time Stanley Cup champion retired in 2005. Ed Jovanovski, Todd Bertuzzi, Mateus Olin, and Marcus Nasland. They would also have some young talent that would become household names in the BC area. Ryan Kessler before he went to the Anaheim Ducks, Alexander Burroughs before he went to the Ottawa Senators. Then there were a couple of first round draft picks in 1999 they had that were Swedish twins. They would spend their entire careers with the Canucks up until their retirements in 2018. The Sedin twins, Henrik and Daniel. Henrik won the Art Ross Trophy and the Hart Trophy in 2010. Daniel won the Pearson Award in 2011, along with the Ross Trophy of his own. Both were two-time All-Stars. Each had won the King Clancy Trophy. While Henrik won the Clancy Award on his own in 2016, the Twins would share the honor in 2018. On top of that, both won Olympic gold at the Winter Games in Turin in 2006. Starting goalie for the Canucks was Alex Odd. In his first few seasons with the Canucks organization, Odd would either be a backup or seasoning in the minor leagues. It wasn't until the 2005-06 season where Odd would become the starter. He would take the role after Dan Cloutier tore his ACL and would have surgery for it. Odd would fit in so well, he won the Cyclone Taylor Trophy for being the team MVP. Then he would be traded to Florida before the 2006 entry draft, and for the bulk of his time, he would bounce around the NHL. His playing career ended in 2012 after he spent a season in the Austrian Hockey League with Red Bull Salzburg. Starting between the pipes for the Sharks, Evgeny Nabokov. The 2005-06 season was a time where the number one goalie since 2001 had to adjust to the new rules and pace of the post-lockout NHL. While he started in more games than Bessa Toscala, his numbers were probably the worst in the Sharks' uniform that year. Even more off-center than his holdout season in 2002-03. He won fewer games, his save percentage was the lowest in his years with the Sharks, his goals against average was the highest in his years with the Sharks. He had one shutout in the 05-06 season. He recorded three in the missed playoff season of 2002-03 and had nine shutouts the following year. He had an off year. It would get better the next season. Toscala needed a night off after the win in Vancouver the night before. Nearly five minutes in the first period, the Canucks would begin the fight to stay alive in the playoff hunt. After the faceoff, Ed Jovanovski had this beautiful blue line blast to give the Canucks the lead. The San Jose Sharks fell behind early, a big point shot, Ed Jovanovski rips it through the pads of... Todd Bertuzzi would get the assist. Near the midway point of the period, Brian Allen on the Canucks flipped the puck over the glass in his own zone. When the NHL woke up from their locked out slumber, many new rules were added to the rule book. 
Instead of the goalie getting a delay of game penalty for flipping the puck over the glass, any player doing that would get slapped with a DOG penalty. Whether or not the offending player accidentally flipped the puck into the crowd from his own zone doesn't matter. Dems the rules. So about 40 seconds later, Nils Ekman would tie the game on the power play. Chichu out there, he gets the puck from Joe. Chichu setting up Carl, he scores! While judging by Ald's body language, it would seem that we were going to be sitting on our hands for a few minutes while the refs sort this one out. Oh, oh it might like have gone in off a skate. That's off a skate now. Is there a direct kicking motion? Check it out in front of the net. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's got it's no That's goal. coming back. That's coming back. To me, that's the main so thing. Good. Get the call yep. right. So after a few minutes to see whether or not Ekman kicked that puck into the net, here's the call. Dealing with something Here, Here's else. the call now. We'll get in it. It's a goal. Well, we didn't get the announcement we expected. But perhaps that's because it was a goal now. The puck went off of Ekman's skate, then he did some kind of kicking motion afterwards. Power play goal counts. Game tied. Matt Carl and Jonathan Chichi would get the helpers on the PPG. The Canucks would continue the fight. A few minutes into the second, Chichi would be called for hooking. While on the power play, they would take back the lead after Brendan Morrison tipped in a Bertuzzi shot. Here's Bertuzzi and they score! Morrison tips it home, and the Canucks get the power play goal to regain the lead. Hannon's up on the plate, tries to come back, can't get to Morrison, bang. Great deflection, very nice goal. Bertuzzi and Marcus Naslin got the points. Near the halfway point of the period, Sean Brown would hook Ekman, and that would be a trip to the penalty box to feel shame. A little over a minute into the power play, the Sharks would tie it again on Chichu's 52nd goal of the season. That's nearly twice the scoring he did the year before. Okay, let's see it. Depression. Pass the puck off. Here's a great goal. Another one-handed effort. Tom Pricing would get the assist along with, as usual, with almost every goal scored by Cheech that year, Joe Thornton. Over six minutes later, Ekman would be thrown in the box for hooking. Vancouver on another power play. A minute into the power play, they would keep their playoff hopes alive for the time being as Bertuzzi found the net to put the Canucks back on top. Stops back to Jovokop, and a loose puck for Bertuzzi, and he scores! His third point of the night, Todd Bertuzzi coming through huge here for the Canucks, and they take back the lead 3-2. Jovanovski and Naslin got the assists. All the Canucks had to do was hold on and maybe get some insurance, and they would live to fight another day. But four and a half minutes in, the Sharks and Billy Niemannen had other plans, as the game would be tied. Nice pass for Niemannen. Here's Billy Niemannen to the front of the net. He's scores! Watch Billy Niemannen. He's going to make the cut. Goes back on the heel. Whoa! It's okay. I rebalanced, resaved the puck, protected it. Kyle McLaren and 2018 Olympic silver medal winning coach Marcel Gosch got the helpers on the tying goal. But the Canucks weren't going to panic yet. They could earn just one point and they still had a shot at a playoff spot. Five minutes later, Mateus Olin would be called for holding. In the closing seconds of the power play, Matt Carl would make them pay. Back to the net. Nabokov will have to play it with a stick. Quickly wrists it up to Thornton. What a great play by Nabokov. Joe drops it back. The trailer. And Matt Carl scores! What a goal! And it all started from Yevgeny Nabokov, who will get an assist. Joe gets to the far end of the ice, the far side of the ice, but Chichu really had to hustle back to get on side. And then nobody picks up Matt Carl. Nabokov would set up the sequence, so he'll get a point along with another assist for Thornton. For the rest of the third, the Canucks were throwing everything but the kitchen sink, but Nabokov was keeping it a one-goal game. Last minute of the period, Vancouver pulls Ald. This was their last stand, their last gasp to stay alive. With 17 seconds left, a familiar combination of that season would administer the kill shot of the Canucks' playoff dreams. Thornton to Chichu for an empty net gimme. Now, Chichu from center gives it to Joe Thornton. Joe to Chichu. He scores! It's over for Vancouver! And Jonathan Chichu and Joe Thornton just throw the heart into the Canucks' playoff plans. Trigger warning, 
I'm about to play the final seconds of the door slamming shut on the Vancouver Canucks. San Jose Sharks have put together a string of wins right now where they've won three back-to-back -back games in a very short period of time. What an effort. This game is over, and the Vancouver Canucks playoff cry is also over. They will not go. The Western Conference playoff race is over. We have our top eight, and the Sharks keep on rolling. That's another win, seven in a row. The Sharks would move up to fifth, and with two games left in the regular season, that's where they would stay. Quite a turnaround despite being on the bubble for most of the season. But that was the kind of luck an NHL team could have in this new era. I mean, there were teams that rotted in last place and won a Stanley Cup in the same year. So another quest would begin for the Stanley Cup. They would face the Nashville Predators in the first round. After losing the first game, the Sharks would dominate the rest of the series. In games 2 and 3, they outscored the Predators 7-1. The team even found ways to win the tight games. A high-scoring 5-4 win in Game 4, and they would head back to Nashville to finish off the Preds with a close 2-1 win in Game 5. After the first round ended, the Sharks got a gift. Home ice advantage for the rest of the Western Conference playoffs. You see, while Nashville got eliminated, the other top three seeds got knocked out in the first round as well, which included the President's Trophy winning Detroit Red Wings. The Wings would join the 1991 Blackhawks and the 2000 Blues as the third team to win the President's Trophy and lose in the first round. 124 points, 58 wins, and they would last six games. This meant the Sharks would face the Edmonton Oilers. They had a familiar name Sharks fans loved to hate during the turn of the century when he was playing for St. Louis, Chris Pronger. The Sharks' momentum continued. They would increase their playoff winning streak, winning two hard-fought games. Game 2 would become Sharks' playoff folklore when they killed an Oilers two-man advantage in the second period that rendered the Sharks' three-man penalty killing line exhausted until a hand clearance would get the Sharks out of the woods. The Sharks kept the momentum going into Game 3. The Sharks had the lead for most of the game and lost it when future Shark Rafi Torres tied the game and forced overtime. More like three overtimes. The Oilers would win in the third overtime. It was bound to happen. The Sharks would try it again in Game 4. They had a 3-1 lead in the second period. This was when the Oilers would take over the series. They scored five unanswered goals and ran Toscala off the ice. The series was even going back to San Jose. Game 5, I would be there as my fiancé got tickets at the last minute. You'll have to ask her how she pulled that one off. When people remarked that the crowd at the Shark Tank were more vocal during the playoffs, they weren't kidding. The Oilers would continue to hold the hammer. At the beginning of the third period, they were up 3-1. Then the Sharks finally pushed back and tied the game at 3. That game-tying goal by Jonathan Chichu would be the last goal the Sharks would score in that series. The Oilers would make my first intended playoff game a somber event. Three unanswered goals and another 6-3 smashing. Going into Game 6 and, well, if anyone has attempted to watch my video about the Sharks and the 6th game jinx, this would end like it did in 2004, losing on the road in 6 games in the province of Alberta by 2 goals. After eliminating the Mighty Ducks in the conference final, the Oilers would reach the finals for the first time since 1990. They wouldn't be the last 8th seeded team to achieve this feat in the new NHL. While the promising Sharks team got eliminated once again, they did have some consolation prizes. Jonathan Chichu would finish the season with 56 goals, which earned him the Rocket Richard Trophy. The Shark that saved San Jose, Joe Thornton, would win the Art Ross Trophy, amassing 125 points, which included 96 assists. 72 of them were in a Sharks uniform. Thornton being Chichu's setup man would also earn him the Hart Memorial Trophy for league MVP. I would like to believe that if the Sharks didn't get Thornton, I don't think they would have made the playoffs, let alone lock up the fifth seed in the conference. Sharks would have to try it again next year. This game, along with the only playoff game I've ever been to, was part of the first Sharks season I had with my future wife when I was there on April 13th, 2006.
There is the uh, Grandpa Remenda. No, that, hey, hey, get that off right now. <laughs> this is my 14-year-old daughter. You'll be putting Grandpa up for anything yet. <laughs> this is uh, the lovely and talented Jordan Lee Remenda came to visit Dad. Hi, baby. It's good to have you. She came down from uh, yesterday from Vancouver, so it's amazing. I'm glad you got Mom's looks. Don't mind. That's the best birthday present Thanks, of all guys. right there. Appreciate that.